Thank you, and uh, thank you to the Society for giving me this opportunity. Uh, no. uh -huh. That's it. Yes. This allegory includes the world's oldest and longest lived commercial logo. The VOC monograms behind the throne incorporates the initials of the Dutch East India Company, founded in 1602 and trading as a global company until 1799. The A above it denotes the Amsterdam Chamber of the company. The interests of this integrated corporation encompassed Southern Africa, India and the East Indies, bringing spices and porcelain for profitable resale in Europe. From the later 17th century, the trade was boosted by Europe's insatiable demand for tea and coffee. To purchase these cargoes, the outgoing ships carried large quantities of silver in coin and ingot form, and some gold. The company was organised into six chambers, of which Amsterdam was the senior. The others were Middleburg, Delft, Rotterdam, Eindhoven, and Hoorn. A fortified base was established at Batavia, modern Jakarta in Indonesia, as the hub of an Asian network supplying the return cargoes. Outward voyages were made via the Cape, Cape of Good Hope, from where the Indian Ocean was crossed, crossed in a southerly latitude to catch the prevailing winds and avoid the unhealthy conditions of the tropics. Before reaching the Australian coast, the ships turned north for Java. Voyages generally took six months each way. Most trips were completed successfully, though human casualties from disease and poor diet were often high. But hazards on the route collected their toll of shipwrecks. Some were lost in the vicinity of European or Asian ports. Others were wrecked around Africa's Atlantic seaboard and the Cape. Several came to grief on the coast of Western Australia. Closer to home, Scotland's northern and western isles reaped a crop of VOC victims. This was because many ships from Dutch ports, particularly during the winter months, took the longer north about route around the British Isles in preference to a shortcut through the Channel, where they'd have to battle against prevailing winds or face the privateers or warships of hostile nations. In consequence, several VOC ships shipwrecks lie in Scottish waters. Five have so far been found and investigated. The Adela of 1728 on Barra and four in Shetland. La Straga of 1634 on Yell, Curacao of 1729 on Unst and two on the exposed Outskerries, the Kenemaland of 1664 and De Liefde of 1711. These last Two are the subject of this talk. On the 20th of December 1664, Kenemaland, outward bound for Batavia, was running before a south southerly gale on a dark night east of Shetland. She should have been further north to clear the islands before heading into the Atlantic, but because of poor weather, she'd been unable to gauge her latitude for some, some days and now the ship's pilot and, and three others were perched on the foretop, uh, peering into the blackness for dangers ahead. They probably heard the breakers only seconds before Kenemaland crashed into a reef called Stura Stack on the Outskerries, a small group of islands east of the main archipelago. Miraculously, they were catapulted onto the adjacent stack. The ship... How does this work? There we are. Uh, the ship hit this thing here, uh, Stora uh, Stack, and this is where the survivors ended up, uh, on Old Man's Stack, as it's now called. Uh, the ship was pounded to pieces on the rocks below, uh, and all remaining 200 on board perished. The cargo manifests record six chests of gold and silver coins, as well as cloth, wine and spirits, tobacco, paper, pitch, and horse harness. There was also a quantity of mercury used to extract, mer uh, extract silver from lead by cupellation. Tons of lead ingots and Dutch bricks were stowed as ballast. The islanders were reputed to have enjoyed a three-week party on the liquor cast ashore. 
The wreck lay in shallow water and salvage efforts organized by local magnates soon recovered the bulk of the treasure and much of the cargo. Thereafter, the wreck was forgotten until 1971, when an expedition by Aston and Manchester universities located Kenamalan's scattered remains. <coughs> Anxious that an investigation should be conducted to proper archaeological standards, they brought in Keith McElroy, a pioneer of underwater archaeology in Britain. That's Keith there. Over the next seven years, Keith used the wreck as a test bed for developing theories about formation processes on scattered shipwrecks, articulated in his now classic book, Maritime Archaeology. His general site plan records Kenamalan's breakup sequence. Tragically, Keith died in a diving accident in 1980, and although progress reports were published regularly during the excavation, a full recording and study of the many finds remained in limbo. This would normally, of course, have been undertaken when the fieldwork was complete, but no one subsequently was able to take on the task. During the early 70s, Keith had been a colleague of mine and Paula's at St Andrews, and since the 1980s, in between other projects, we've been working on this important artefact collection, lodged in its entirety in the Shetland Museum. Uh, who we greatly acknowledge their friendly support and assistance, and we also acknowledge uh, a partial grant from HES. Final publication, uh, we hope, is now close, so let me just give you a, a taster of some of its archaeological riches. The core of the site was indicated by large numbers of lead ingots and traditional Dutch bricks. These were paying ballast and would have been used for building at the Cape and Batavia. Marks on the ingots indicate they are of English origin and some bear the date 1664, the year of the wreck. And this, of course, is, is, is this kind of artefact that normally escapes the archaeological record because uh, they're in ingot form just for transport and subsequent reuse. Many objects were encased in concretion, which were recovered in blocks uh, for careful disse dissection in the laboratory. Here's one such block prepared for lifting. It produced a variety of uh, well-preserved trinkets, painstakingly, painstakingly extracted and conserved by the museum's former curator, uh, the great Tom Henderson. The objects comprise multiple groups, suggesting that they'd been carried as cargo. They include seven brass tobacco boxes decorated with various Dutch scenes and townscapes, and three examples are shown here. Some are engraved with quotations, and one bears the date, 1664, again the date of the wreck. Note the example on the left, which celebrates the pleasures of smoking and drinking, but urges that they should be enjoyed in moderation, accompanied by good food and music. The end of a fiddle bow, complete with its knotted horsehair string, indeed hints at musical entertainment on board. There were more than two dozen brass thimbles and curved brass pins associated with an elaborate <coughs> 17th century hairstyle with hooked ends for uh, ornamental janglers. You can see one in this detail of a portrait by Cornelius van de Voort. This style would have been rather old-fashioned in 1664. There were also cheap pewter pendants hung on brass chains and brass rings with imitation stones. Popular pastimes uh, represented by 20 pieces of dice and pewter golf club heads among the earliest known. Quite exceptionally well preserved were two exquisite pocket sundials made in Nuremberg, one still retaining its printed and coloured compass card. That these artefacts were found in multiples show little sign of wear, and one was made in the same year as the wreck implies that they were cargo rather than personal items. But they're not listed in the ship's otherwise detailed cargo manifest. There's a probable, probable explanation. 
each crew member on the Indies run was allowed to take a chest of goods for private trade. The items were assembled prior to the voyage, um, uh, often with the help of a female partner. The objects sought would have to be attractive to purchasers, durable, of low volume, cheap to obtain, but, obtaining, but, but commanding a high markup when sold to colonists or natives on the other side of the world. 17th century Europe, particularly Holland, was on the cusp of a consumer revolution and Amsterdam lay at its heart. Economies of scale and burgeoning techniques of mass production were producing just the kind of low-priced popular items as, that we see in this assemblage. And so they probably come from an individual seaman's trading chest. All these items would therefore have escaped enumeration in the ship's manifest. Careful archaeology has thus unlocked this anonymous box to reveal its priceless cache of cheap treasure. Personal items are also well represented. Examples include a pewter spoon with a horse's hoof finial uh, and an elaborate shoe buckle. Leather footwear was also recovered. While these woven strips of fabric show that even cl clothing can sometimes be, be preserved in underwater environments. The assemblage includes specialist equipment, like a writing slate ruled in columns, slate pencils, and a, a, a lead inkwell. This iron mould for casting lead shot was one of a number found, suggesting that they may have been part of the cargo, while the object on the right is the sailmaker's needle case. Other objects clearly belong to the documented cargo. Though most of the treasure was recovered by early salvers, a few coins remained. There were several intact stoneware flagons and many sherds from Frechen in the Rhineland, with their characteristic grotesque face masks and decorative escutcheons. These were mainly used for liquor, but at least one still contained 40 kilos of mercury. Another common container was the square glass case bottle, traditionally associated with Dutch gin. Dozens of their pewter screw, screw tops, some with pieces of, of the bottles attached, were found scattered across the wreck. Our second wreck is De Liefde, the Love, wrecked on the southwestern tip of Skerries in December 1711. Like Kenemaland, she'd evidently misjudged her position and struck Myoness at night. There was only one survivor. Little was salvaged at the time, but in the 1720s, Captain Jacob Rowe and others, um, Rowe had patented this remarkable diving machine, um, and they recovered much from the, the wreck. The local name of the spot, Dregging Geo, no doubt reflects the process of dragging up the finds with a grapnel. From time to time, finds are still cast up on shore, including this ducket, one of several that were found on the wreck, uh, which bears the date uh, of the wreck, 1711. This was the first shipwreck to be located in modern times in British waters. It was discovered in 1964 by divers from a naval minesweeper, and their finds were lodged in the Shetland Museum. Alan Bax, a pioneer of underwater archaeology in Britain, was able to make this site plan. Unfortunately, the wreck was then taken over by a treasure hunting consortium from London, and most of their recoveries were sold. Since the 1970s, however, others have worked intermittently on the wreck, and a sampling of the material is now in the museum, and we've been recording it along with the Kenemaland finds. Of special interest is the ship's bronze bell, recovered in several pieces and restored in the museum's laboratory. It carries the inscription Soli Deo Gloria and the date 1700. This confirms, if further confirmation is needed, de Liefter's identification. Her keel was laid down in 1698 and her first voyage to the Indies began in 1701. Two successful uh, return trips followed and the final ill-fated voyage began in October 1711 under Captain Barent Mutjens. 
Although most of a Dutch East Indiaman's guns were cast of cast iron, a pair of bronze six-pounders were mounted on either side of the compasses to minimise deviation. Both of Liefters have been recovered, and this one is still preserved on Skerries. The guns were cast at Rotterdam in 1687 by Johan Uderog and carry the VOC monogram. It incorporates the D mark of the company's Delft chamber, an instance of guns being exchanged between ships as de Liefde belonged to the Amsterdam chamber. The wreck has also yielded a bronze swivel gun, complete with two removable breech blocks. All bear the Amsterdam cipher. Personal weaponry is well represented. Someone of high status must have owned the silver sword hilt on the left, replete with classical figures and an Amsterdam hallmark. The brass components on the right are from much plainer weapons and are probably to be associated with the hundred soldiers on board. The objects at the bottom uh, left are clips for securing the, the scabbard into its frog. The all-powerful VOC enjoyed the privileges of a nation-state, including the right to wage war. Several other finds can be associated with military equipment, like the musket lock plates at bottom right, um, uh, bearing the familiar logo, as well as the city arms of Amsterdam. The more elaborate pieces below them uh, come from private weapons, while the two tubular items are ramrod housings. On the upper left are three copper cartridges, which would have, been, uh, which would have held a, a, a charge of powder and a lead bullet wrapped in cloth. Um, uh, they, the, the ball is still in place um, in, in the one on the left. Twelve cartridges would be contained in a leather pouch strapped round a musketeer's waist, as shown in the reconstruction, which is based on complete examples discovered on another wreck. Uh, the brass buckles at the lower right of that top uh, picture um, uh, uh, come from such pouches. While on the other hand, these buckles um, are associated with, associated with shoes and clothing of a more civilian nature. Merchants on board are represented by a seal and signet ring bearing their marks and a lead bell seal which probably comes from a bolt of cloth. Cutlery is common on VOC wrecks. The left-hand spoon in the, the, uh, the drawing um, <coughs> is pewter and stamped with the VOC cipher, which you see in de detail further on the left. Uh, the one on the right is a fine silver piece with the incised initials BM, and these are very probably those of de Liefter's captain, the 38-year-old Baron Muchkins. Many knife handles have been found, and some at least were probably cargo. The three on the left are of pressed and moulded bone. The helmeted figure is of a horn, while the right-hand example is of hardwood with a brass ferrule. These pewter dishes are unusual. As you can see, they're only about five centimetres in diameter. They may have been for sweetmeats or possibly toys. Other high-status artefacts include bits of fine baluster drinking glasses with their characteristic teardrop stems and an un unopened, well, it's only the broken neck, but it, the cork is still in place, bottle of sparkling wine uh, to put in them. The twisted wire retainer is just as, as the same as we encounter today uh, uh, and a decorated tumbler is shown at bottom left. Whatever one's rank, there was little time or opportunity for recreation or luxury on board. But in 1711, uh, almost everybody smoked tobacco. De Liefde has produced a fine collection of clay pipes, mostly high quality pieces, well finished and smoothly burnished. All, so far as we can ascertain, were made in Gouda, which by 1711 was almost exclusively Holland's pipe making centre. Um, much is known about this industry from its records. 
uh, and nearly all the 29 different heel marks that we've recorded can be identified with known makers. Finds like these, lost in a closed context at a precise moment in time, can do much to test and refine established typologies. And this, of course, goes for all, many classes of artefacts. Uh, this and many other typological studies underlines the importance as well as the interest of preserving and properly investigating historic shipwrecks and their contents. These two little figurines are pipe tampers for packing tobacco into the bowl. One shows a broad-hatted Dutchman raising his tankard aloft. The other is a turbaned Indian in a short dhoti. Uh, as smoking accessories go, uh, they're rare and attractive finds. But as reminders of the VOC's role in starting processes that still underpin the modern world, they are of consequence to all of us today. I've only begun to been able to highlight a few aspects of two very specialised early modern shipwrecks and demonstrate their significance within their tightly focused historical parameters. But they're by no means representative of all wrecks and they point to a wider revolution which has quietly been taking place over the past generation in Scottish archaeology. Floating craft have been plying our coastal and inland waters for as long as humans have inhabited what is now Scotland. Many have sunk, some in circumstances which will have preserved within the seabed environment parts of their structures and a wide range of their contents. These archaeological formations represent a rich, fragile and largely unexplored part of our heritage, worthy of protection and much wider study. They have for too long been regarded as peripheral, I think, to the mainstream of archaeology. Their place should be at its core, and the challenge for the rising generation is to integrate this resource into a wider archaeological whole, above and below the water. Thank you. <laughs>